knowing that we knowing that microglia uh, uh, you, uh, can undergo exophagy in presence of a large amyloid beta plaques, uh, one thing that we wanted to know is the mechanism behind this process. We can go more in depth about the inhibitors that we use, but since we're covering the topic of TREM2, I'd like to stick on that. So basically, we wanted to know if any of the genetic risks for Alzheimer's disease also play a role in that, because it's known in literature that TREM2 plays a role in clearance of amyloid beta and also their uptake. And since we know that the, the, um, the mechanism that we're working on is also plays a role in uptake and the clearance of amyloid, we wanted to see if TRIM2 have an effect on that. So what we saw is that when we have TRIM2 knockout microglia, and then we uh, we treat them with the amyloid beta plaques. And then, so basically this process is around 90 minutes. I just need to mention that. So the process here, again, just to explain it, and when we look at lysosomal cytosis, the cells are loaded with dextrin, fitzy biotin, uh, biotin dextrin, and the plaques have tryptavidin. And what we notice is that there is significant uh, secretion of the lysosomal content um, towards those aggregates from the trim to knockout cells. And when we look at actin polymerization from these same cells, we saw a significant decrease in actin polymerization. So not only these cells are firing more, you know, more lysosomal content towards the aggregate, but at the same time, there is a deficiency in actin polymerization, which is, um, was expected because when we look at the literature, you do see that trim to, uh, um, deficient microglia, they have a deficiency in actin polymerization and they don't really uptake uh, amyloid beta really well. So knowing that that uh, TREM2 knockout microglia secrete a lot more lysosomal content, this led us to speculate that maybe what's happening here is that in the uh, brain, when you have TREM2, you know, there is very TREM2 deficient microglia, is there's a possibility that those cells, yes, they don't really take as much of the amyloid beta, but whatever they take, and then they go into somewhere else in the brain, they're going to end up secreting more of that fibrils to a different region. Maybe this could be a mechanism to how uh, microglia cells, and we're going to trim to mutation, might be able to spread amyloid fibril uh, in the brain. And Santi has been looking into this to look at that secretion process from the trim to cells, and then he will um, explain this to you. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was a, su a surprise. We knew that the cells would, they did not recruit a lot of, act a lot of they did not polymerize a lot of actin around plaques to begin with, and that is known in the, in, in, in the field. But we did not expect to see such increased rates in lysosomal exocytosis. So the trend shoes, knock, the trend shoes knockout microglia released lysosomal contents at what, about three to four? Yeah. Three, three to four, four, yeah, four. Yeah. So, and, and that later on made sense because when you, so when the cells release lysosomes, they need to clear actin at the release site. But trend shoes knockouts, they don't have a lot of actin to begin with. So it's much easier for these cells to ex exercise those lysosomal contents. And proof of that is that, so Rudy treated some sets of cells with GMCSF, and GMCSF increased, it, it's, a, it's a cytokine that's used to in, in, uh, in culturing, in growing cells in microglia. And what, what he saw was that microglia that were treated with GMCSF, they were able to polymerize actin 15 times more when compared with cells which were not treated. But these cells were no longer able to fire lysosomes to, to exercise those lysosomal contents when compared with cells which were not treated. So, so the connection was very clear in there. And then, so what we did next was to, so we had the hypothesis that we had was that, well, you know, if, if microglial cells can release lysosomal contents, Right, we have been doing all these experiments with cells that were loaded with dextrin. But what happens in the real, in the real scenario? Maybe the microglial cells engage a plaque, and after that, the lysosomes become loaded with amyloid beta, and then the cells cannot digest it, so they might go somewhere else, engage in digestive exophagy, and release those lysosomal contents. Or maybe this could apply for any any type of Toxic fibril can be tau, alpha synuclein. So to test for that hypo hypothesis, what we did was that so really prepared plaques, also amyloid, uh, amyloid beta aggregates, and then we sonicated them into smaller fibrils. Mm -hmm. And then we loaded the microglia with them. So the fibrils ended up, uh, incor they incorporated in, in the lysosomes eventually. 
And after that, we just incubated these loaded microglia with larger amyloid beta aggregates. And what we saw was that only uh, only with after 90 minutes, so even you know 90 minutes, we're not talking about three days or two days incubations. 90 minutes after incubation, we saw that the cells had released a lot of lysosomal contents towards the plaques. So the plaques appear decorated with new fibrils coming from the lysosomes of the cells, which were labeled with a different dye. So we could see the incorporation around the plaques. So that made us think that, you know, if this happens within 90 minutes, uh, what would happen with longer periods of time? So this was a very preliminary experiment. We are still uh, working on that. But the plan is to repeat this with cells which are deficient in TREM2. And we expect to see much more release of lysosomal contents.